Um, so my group are going to be presenting their project citizen presentations. Uh, they each research different problems in the community or the world and try to come up with some solutions and ways to solve those problems. Um, this is a project that we do every year in uh, Power to the People. So if it's something that you see that looks kind of interesting and you're thinking of a social studies credit that you want to take um, and you want to do something like this, it's in Power to the People. Um, so uh, I'd like to just uh, invite the first group to come on up and um, the floor is yours. I'm Camden. And I'm Veronica, and we are with Mr. Peterson's Power to People class. Um, for our Project Citizen presentation, we decided to work on COVID restrictions and how they have affected the mental health of students in schools. So, what kinds of restrictions are we talking about? Reduced days has caused friends to not see each other as often. More individual work, so the same amount of work has been pretty much dealt as previous years, but less time in class to learn the material. No extracurricular activities, no sports, uh, clubs, things like that. And the cohort days has caused friends to split up and not see each other as often or at all. Um, so Students' mental health has been affected by the COVID pandemic, and students with depression and anxiety have experienced this much more than those who are undiagnosed. Although everyone feels isolated and alone, we have seen that students who are diagnosed have struggled more. Um, there's been a sharp increase in stress among the whole school, and grades have either worsened and the material is not. Um, to first start off proving this problem, we conducted a few interviews. The first one being with the math and science tutor, Mrs. Haskell. Um, she says she hasn't been able to help as many people this year because she is partially teaching. Um, and students aren't taking school as seriously as they used to be, and they're not as motivated as they have been in previous years. The second person we interviewed was Mrs. Barry, and she told me that there is a higher demand for bodies in the pandemic because students are feeling more isolated. And she believes that you need your basic needs to be met, like your mental health, to be academically successful, and as far as to hold students accountable to be the best that they can be when these uh, mental issues are going on. And then we interviewed Ms. Kitchen, and she discussed with me about how we started a drop-in counseling days this year, and that has helped a lot of students, particularly in virtual students, uh, help in everything. And she discussed uh, the habit schedule that we did before. Uh, we also read in guidance that 26% of guidance visits have been for personal issues, and 97% of them have been tests for issues which is almost as much as previous years in the only half of time which causes a new crisis. This is also a problem nationally. Um, in Georgia, they conducted a survey that said no person felt anxiety or depression, 43% felt isolated, and 15% felt stressed because of the pandemic. So a story that shows all this happening, taken from a PBS interview, is Victoria Canales, a young college student at the University of Texas, had no one to talk to, to her at her apartment because of the COVID restrictions. She started panicking and stopped taking her antidepressants, where she soon after called the college's hotline. She did find help, but it, this just shows how widespread mental illness due to the restrictions have gone. There are a lot of students like her that feel isolated, depressed, cynical, suicidal, or any combination of these, and most of the time they do not find help. Here are some quotes from the same story. 
Jasmine Guerrero says, I'm just turning into silence without even knowing if the information is staying with me. An anonymous student says, I don't feel like I'm learning crap. I'm sure we could all can relate to that. Lily Art says that it's hard to sleep at night because you just sit in your apartment all day. And Jack Foley says, no matter who you are, it really sucks. And Hannah Richardson says that college seems like a faraway concept now. I'm sure that some of you can totally relate to some of these quotes. So the three of us sent a survey to the Herman High classes, and with 78 responses, we got great insight into the thoughts and opinions of the students at Herman High, and we made some data charts out of those. 53% of students felt like the school that the school has tried their best to support students, but it still isn't enough during the COVID pandemic. 56% that the field of students feel like the school has gotten more stressful during the COVID. 56% of students feel like the lack of structure in a two-day school week has caused them to take school less seriously. Nearly three-fourths of students have said that attending school on different days than your friends has affected their experience in a negative way. And three out of every four students has felt like they do not have enough time to socialize during school. Another possible solution is allowing excusable absences due to mental health. Uh, apparently this is already being done, but perhaps allowing more of these would help. The pros of this is that it, help, oh, sorry. it helps students relieve stress and gives them a day to cope, relax, and turn their brain off. But a con would be that some students will inevitably abuse this feature. Um, mandatory emotional check-ins is our third option, and these would be in the structure of a Google form, and they'd be taken multiple times a year. One pro, uh, pro of this is that people who don't like to be proactive about their mental health or reach out first and talk to someone now have a way to do so, and if they want to, they can expand on that and maybe do a one-on-one -on -one meeting. A con of this would be people who don't like to reach out may feel pressured in the sense of don't feel or will lie anyway if they don't feel um, things that they do. Um, mandatory emotional check-ins was the policy that we chose. Um, we reached out to a few people and they said that this would be the best option and would be most attainable for our school. Um, we chose it because it's the easiest to make happen and it enables people who aren't proactive to make the first step. The first step we took into making this uh, solution a reality was uh, talking to guidance. We talked into the program to see if this would be possible, and we found out that it would be. And we discussed the uh, possibility of having a Google form as our check in instead of a uh, traditional paper copy. We decided that that would be best, and multiple check ins throughout the year would help around hard times of the holidays. The second step was contacting the principal. We, e we emailed Mr. Walsh to see who we need to talk to to make these Google Forms happen and to just keep him up in the loop of what's, what we're doing. We suggested that these forms be mandatory and that they be sent every few months during the holidays, beginning, end of school, etc. 
As far as we know, we've yet to get a response, but once we do, we'll move to step three. And step three is consulting. Once we receive a answer from Mr. Wong, we will go to whoever he pedestrian safety areas for the town of Herman. Um, so, in 2017, 21 people were killed walking along or near main roads. Um, and according to ABC, the number of pedestrian death is growing. So, we conducted a survey, and in the survey, um, it, it, we conducted that it was a problem because 62% of people said they would only walk on certain roads without those pedestrian safety areas. 14% um, never walk on roads without pedestrian safety areas, and around 75% are not comfortable without them. 27 of the 50 respondents we got lived less than five miles away, and most of them said they wouldn't feel comfortable walking, running, or biking without those pedestrian safety areas. Um, on average in Maine, one person gets hit by motor vehicles each day, and 90% of crashes cause injury or death. Um, so, just for an example, on a 40 mile per hour road, there's an 85% chance of death, 15% chance of being injured, and little to no chance of coming out unscathed. Um, so, these are our charts. Um, so, here it says, 90% um, never walk to Herman High School from your house. And as I just said, there are a lot of people who live less than five miles away who could possibly do that. Um, and then, would you feel safe walking on roads without sidewalk? Around more than 75% said yes, or it depends on the road. just show increased pedestrian safety rates and how um, the pedestrian safety is important. So I'm going to hand it off to you. Okay. Our group came up with four alternative policies. One was increasing, okay, increasing education for drivers and then extending the shoulder of the road, so making it larger and then making a sidewalk and, or increasing the sidewalks and uh, fill, fixing roads, filling potholes. So for the first alternative policy, um, uh, educating drivers, it's very cheap, 100 to 500 dollars. It only requires one person to educate everyone. Uh, educating drivers will make them aware of the danger they pose to pedestrians. Choosing this would reach many people in a short amount of time. Uh, some cons to educating drivers. Um, we know that it is very difficult to stay focused during a long lecture such as this. Um, and they also don't, uh, they also have studies showing that uh, lectures don't have a long-term effect on people. So that could pose problems. Um, so the pros for extending the shoulder, um, uh, they can only be, they can be used by bicyclists, both bicyclists and pedestrians. The shoulder is also part of the road, which makes it less expensive, which makes it the least expensive option, um, especially if extending the shoulder is done while the road is being paved. 
uh, this makes it less than half the price of a sidewalk at $200,000, which is relatively cheap. Um, the cons of extending the shoulder is that we know, we also know that the edge of the, the road is prone to crack or fall off, or and then fall off. Extending the shoulder can also ruin the low clutter environment of a rural road. Um, sidewalks. Uh, sidewalks are very effective with pedestrian safety and traffic. Uh, sidewalks would easily keep runners and walkers safe. We also see that many people use sidewalks that have previously been provided, so there's no reason to say that they wouldn't use the ones that could be provided. Uh, cons are that the downside of sidewalks would cost a fortune, about $500,000. They are by far the most expensive option on our, for, for, for alternative policies. Uh, another downside is they can't be used by bikers. Uh, it takes months to build them. Um, and just like extending the shoulder, it may ruin the low clutter environment of a rural road. Um, the pros to fixing roads is that potholes in roads could cause a driver to lose control. Oh, that's not a pro. <laughs> could lose control and hit a pedestrian. Uh, but the pro is that we should fill in potholes, or if you fill in potholes, cracks, and repairing other parts of the road, this would be effective to a degree. It wouldn't be perfect. Uh, the cons is that only potholes and cracks that have been, or potholes and cracks that have been filled in and over, will reappear over time. Um, and then, yeah. Um, so, despite the four alternative policies that we found that were all be very effective, we decided that sidewalks would be the best option for our town. Um, they might be more expensive than all of the other policies that we researched, but we did find that they are the most effective. Um, currently, there is less than a mile of sidewalk in Herman. It stretches from the high school to around Patton Drive, which is a little bit after the middle school. And currently, uh, we would like to add uh, extend that sidewalk another mile from Patton Road to Fuller Road because we feel that that will be the most effective spot to put it. We have found that other cities, including Bangor, have put in more sidewalks, and through those sidewalks, they found that there is a decreased chance of a pedestrian being hit um, while they're walking. Uh, Bangor recently added around 1.3 miles of sidewalks in the areas other than their downtown, and they found that that was very helpful to students who were walking home from their high school into the nearby neighborhoods. And we also found that people in our town who we interviewed, their most suggested comment was that we should add in a sidewalk someplace where students would be able to walk home. We do admit that it is a very expensive, but we also feel that it would be the most effective. Uh, the standard width of a sidewalk is around 48 inches wide, and it has to be at least four, feet, uh, four inches thick to prove effective over time. Um, so the cost for around a general lane mile is around $485,000, but we do want to note that you would split that cost with the main department of transportation and it would also come from other interest groups. Um, despite the costs, we feel that pedestrian safety and benefits would outweigh these cons. Um, we also found that because of where we would like to place a sidewalk, the shoulder on the side is very small and we would have to push into some people's yards, but we feel that once those people found that pedestrians walking near their homes would be safer, they would find that the benefits outweigh the cons. So the sidewalk that we would like to place would run from Patton Drive to Folder Road, and there would be a lot of benefits in placing the sidewalk there. We would be able to connect the Herman Recreational Trails, which run from the high school to the elementary school, which would make it safer for walkers who are walking on those trails. They would be able to go in a circle without feeling the need to walk on the side of the road. It would also make it easier for bikers who wish to bike along that way. Um, we've also noted that there's a 26% increase in our town's population in the last couple of years, which means that there will be an increased number of walkers on the side of the road, which means that we will need safer pedestrian routes for them. Uh, we also, while we were researching this place, we found that our high school cross country and track teams frequently run on this road next to less than a foot away from cars that are going by them at like 45 miles an hour. And at that speed, there's an 80% chance of death if you're hit. It's 
So we feel that it would also increase the safety of our own high school students. Um, and we also found that our town has actually already acknowledged the danger of this and that they have started to put in some measures, but we feel that our sidewalk would be able to help the town with pedestrian safety more than just the couple of feet of sidewalk that they are planning on putting in from the middle school to schoolhouse lane. And I will hand it off to Grace now for our action plan. Okay. So, we've been parents for sidewalk in three years, and they plan to extend the sidewalk about 20 feet from the middle school to the schoolhouse lane, and they plan to put a crosswalk in, uh, across the road. But our group believes that we need to put a sidewalk in right now so that we can prevent any pedestrian injuries or deaths. We plan to put the sidewalk in from Pine Drive to Fuller Road. There are many potential roadblocks for this. Residents living along the planned route, moving telephone poles back, culverts, the material to build the sidewalk, time to install and the maintenance in the winter. For our residents, we just have to talk to them, explain why we want to put the sidewalk in, the benefits of it, and we just have to convince them that this is a good idea. If they agree that it's a good idea, then we just have to ask them if we can take two or three feet of their land to benefit the rest of the community. For the telephone poles, we may not, may not have to move them because telephone poles are usually four or five feet from the edge of the road. So the sidewalk would be about four feet, so we wouldn't even have to worry about them. And if we do run into that, we would just talk to the engineer we're working with. The culverts, they can be either built over, filled in, or moved. So we would talk to the engineer if we run into any problems and see what they thought was the best option. The material for a sidewalk is cement or concrete. They're both very similar and they're both really easy to find because they um, are commonly used. So we would choose the best one that we're going to get the most bang for our buck. The installation of sidewalks is not a big deal. The biggest time consumer is actually just planning to put the sidewalk in getting an engineer, figuring out where we're going to put it, everything like that. Putting in the sidewalk takes very any time, so that would be pretty easy. The maintenance of the sidewalk is not very much. In the summer, there's nothing that needs to be done. In the winter, you would just need to hire somebody, which other towns have done, and that person would need to make sure that the sidewalk is always shoveled or plowed or whatever so that people can use it. These roadblocks all have easy solutions and the benefits of the sidewalk outweigh the cons of it, so we need to put it in. For collecting funds, we have to create a list of improvements, a preliminary estimate for the cost using past sidewalks at Herman and other towns. We have to show the maintenance of the sidewalk, how we're going to do that. One interest group we can use is Safe Routes to School. It's a program that can help fund us. They enable and encourage children, including those with disabilities, to get to school safely. If Safe Routes to School can fund us, they can give us a project minimum of 20%. At the municipal level, the Hermantown office needs to approve the sidewalk because it's their job to organize the whole thing and maintain the sidewalk. We reached out to the main DOT, the state level, and they're important because the engineers are going to help design the whole project and they're going to be able to help us find the sidewalk. The PTA is another interest group that may be able to help. The sidewalk will go past the Herman Elementary School, which is on Billings Road, so they may believe that this is a good idea because then kids can go from all three schools safely and they can get to all their neighboring neighborhoods. The Bicycle Coalition of Maine is the last interest group that we have. They may be able to help because all the trails in the woods would be connected so kids can go through all of them safely. The only problem we run into is taxpayers. They may not, may not be able to fund it because they don't want to. We just need to convince them and show that it will help the whole community and keep everybody safer, their kids, their friends, kids, everybody. The road construction company that we plan to use is the Brown Construction Company. We would use them because they can put in the sidewalk and they're located right in Herman. Their headquarters are actually right near Fuller Road where we plan to end the sidewalk. The exact steps we need, that we need to take are we need to call the main DOT, then go down to the site, explain why we want to do it there, what the benefits are. We need to complete a funding application and show how the town
town has the money, the 20% that they need. And then in September, the main DOT will review the application and fund a couple of the projects. If our application isn't funded then, then we can send it back in once we fix all of our weaknesses. We have to locally gather information, build a consensus about who would use it and why they would use it. We have to approach the school committee. We have to present all of our ideas, explain to them why it's a good idea. We have to use all of our research that we have, and then they can vote on it. If they pass it, we'll be moved on to the next step. We emailed the Herman Town office, and they told us the steps that we exactly need to follow, getting information, raising funds, estimate the time and cost of the project. We have to get an engineer to help with the design. We have to talk at the town meeting, explain everything about our project like we're doing here, and then they can vote on it to pass it. The project would take at least two years to implement, but they believe that it would be a great idea to see in the future. We called the main DOT, and they told us that we need to submit an application for funding. Herman needs to contribute at least 20% of the cost. And this is why we believe sidewalks would be the best solution to solve the problems of pedestrian safety in our town. We hope that in the near future, we can implement sidewalks to solve our problem. Today marks the second day of our, I guess, second semi-annual social studies gala, where we have a number of presentations for you here today. We'll start with two Project Citizen presentations. The first one will be on storm water runoff. The second one will be on how we fund our roads. Following that, we have some performances. Uh, it looks like a interpretation of the Trojan War, and a historic rap battle. Okay. So, to kick us off, we will look at the exciting world of storm water runoff in the Penobscot River, something that is near and dear to our hearts. Um, so, as you just said, it's storm water runoff in the Penobscot. And uh, it's presented by us for um, Josh, Kyle, Derek, and Brian. Um, um, here's our table of contents. I'm going to be doing the first section, and then Kyle, and then Brian, and Josh. Water pollution in Maine is a serious matter, and many people who surveyed believe that it is a major problem. But what is polluting the Maine waterways? The Penobscot River is one of the largest rivers in Maine. Spanning at about 110 miles long, many people we polled came from a variety of communities with concerns about river pollution and similar in each county. The state of Maine as a whole is very focused on protecting the environment, and water is a key part to that environment. The main concern is that Maine's Penobscot River is badly polluted due to stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff is a combination of rain and melting snow that picks up and mixes with pollutants such as oil, soaps, animal feces, garbage, weed killer, pesticides, and other agricultural chemicals. The runoff then flows into tributaries and storm drains and gets into the river from there. Oil heavily pollutes water. One quart of oil can pollute 250,000 gallons of water. An estimated 140,000 gallons of oil have been spilled into the Penobscot. This is a major problem. The reason why this is a problem is because all of the plumes I have listed previously are very harmful to the environment. Animal feces in water can cause salmonella, which can make, you, which can make people sick. Agricultural chemicals like pesticides and weed killer cause algae to grow in the fish or in the river and chemicals to kill fish as well. Algae is not good for the river because it clogs the ecosystem and it also deteriorates Maine's tourism value. The storm drains that the pollution flows in. The storm drains that the pollution flows into starts to become clogged with waste, and water stays longer on the streets and gathers more pollution before flowing into the river. All the pollutants cause major problems, and the solution for all is preventing stormwater runoff. The solution for stormwater runoff has not been solved, and the current problem implemented by the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, does not work. The EPA provides a permit called an NPDES, a National Pollution Discharge Elimination System. It allows companies to dispel pollutants like oil into water with a permit. This does not work well with our aim to prevent stormwater runoff pollution. I'm now going to pass the mic to Kyle, who will explain some better policies we've found through the research to change this policy. So 
So at this point, we've uncovered the problem, toxic stormwater runoff and where it is occurring. This pollution problem has accumulated because of an ineffective policy that is still in place. This policy has allowed unfiltered waste to drain into the Penobscot and allowed residents to contribute to the pollution unpenalized, from the pesticides in their lawn to the car oil they dump onto roads. What is necessary now is finding an effective policy. The first alternative policy is the Clean Water Act of 1972, which is actually the policy that is put in place in the Penobscot watershed at the moment. This is a nationwide policy used in many locations effectively. It is not effective in some areas such as the Penobscot watershed and the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. This policy has worked regulating industrial discharges, but has not helped us, but has not helped to stop stormwater runoff. Officials in the Chesapeake Bay area of Maryland ask residents not to swim 48 hours after a storm due to lingering toxic waste that could affect human health from the greased oil and other chemicals in the water. So although this could work for the Penobscot watershed situation, extensive changes would need to be made for this policy, therefore making it ineffective. The next policy is the Rivers Protection Act of 1996 which originates from Massachusetts. This policy's positive aspects are that it regulates pesticides specifically, which is something that a third of Penobscot watershed residents use in their lawns. It also regulates the cleanliness of storm drainage, which is something the Penobscot watershed struggles with. The unfortunate piece of this alternative policy is that it was made for higher density populations, such as the large city of Boston. Maine is too rural for the scale of these regulations. For example, we do not need to check our storm drains as often as Boston does. So, although this, although this policy is a strong contender, some changes would need to be made. The third alternative policy that we researched, the Navigable Waters Protection Rule, was put in place early last summer by the Trump administration. It is less formally known as the Dirty Water Rule, and was used to replace the Clean Water Act in some parts of the country. This policy was designed to help the oil and farming industries by removing protections on previously protected wetlands and streams. This allowed these industries to expand their businesses and it left snow and precipitation based wetlands and watersheds vulnerable to pollution as protections were removed and toxic stormwater flowed into residential areas. This type of pollution would only work effectively, this type of policy would only work effectively in a location that has stormwater pollution under control. Maine and the Penobscot watershed are not at that stage yet, so it would not be a good option for our pollution issue. The last alternative policy is the buffer or no spray zone policy. This policy comes partly from Utah and also from our team's ideas. For example, this policy is similar to the River Protection Act as it does not allow pesticides or fertilizer usage 500 feet from rivers and their tributaries. This would help to control stormwater runoff pollution because harmful pesticides that affect marine life health would not be in our rivers. This policy, policy is also very cost effective as no infrastructure would need to be needed would need to be implemented for this policy. However, this policy will negatively affect farms on the Penobscot watershed as they will not be able to use necessary pesticides for farming. Another negative aspect of this policy is that it is too broad. This policy has been used for other reasons such as organic farming and not for stormwater runoff pollution, thus proving insufficient for the Penobscot watershed and its pollution problem. So after researching these four alternative policies and analyzing the pros and cons of each, we have found that the Rivers Protection Act of 1996 will be the most effective in controlling stormwater runoff pollution in the Penobscot watershed. The RPA is the best choice for the needs of changes, and we will further discover that in the next section. Discharging many pollutants such as pesticides, oils, antifreeze, etc. The filtration system for stormwater runoff is not effective and allows for much of the pollution to seep into the Penobscot watershed and river. A proposed policy to replace the current Clean Water Act, the Rivers Protection Act, which derives from Massachusetts, would get the job done with a few alter uh, alterations made, of course. The Rivers Protection Act of 1996 uses a variety of methods in order to sustain a healthier aquatic ecosystem by stopping sources of stormwater runoff related pollution. These methods include arboreal filtration, which is trees and plant life, agricultural activity pollution prevention, microcontamination prevention, and large amounts, and large amounts of uh, pesticide prohibition. Such methods consist of arboreal filtration, which trees and other uh, plant life naturally extract harmful chemicals, redistribute uh, sediments, 
and keep a more beneficial runoff system. In addition to trees, uh, the addition of trees also allows for a more structurally supported riverside and uh, surrounding grounds, something that could prevent landslides and large amounts of sediments from falling or slipping away into the waters below. Therefore, forestry is not permitted in the rivers. Another aspect of the river's protection is the removal of agricultural activities from 300 feet of the riverfront or waterfront. A, uh, that, 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 that is to uh, lessen the amount of pollutants, such as weed killers and fertilizers, for being swept away into stormwaters and injuring public waterways. Such chemicals have been known to clog fishes' filtration systems as well as cause organ damage or failure within aquatic creatures. Pets such as dogs are prohibited from walks and rivers, as their feces contain harmful microbes that can affect local ecosystems and public health. A prime example being Seminole, which is a bacteria that causes fever and diarrhea and blood in the school of humans. Mosquito control or extermination projects are not allowed either, as their airborne chemicals can eat, uh, enter waterways. Oh, sorry. Um, mosquito fogging also passes by the natural filtration process from trees and plant life around the riverside which then allows the chemicals, like other pesticides, to go straight into the waterway, waterway and, the, and the ecosystems in any unfortunate swimmers. There are many uh, differences between Maine and Massachusetts, like the lower population and the density of said population. According to the Maine Shoreline Zoning Law, the state only needs to check the storm drains every three years, while Massachusetts needs to check it at least once a week. A check as often as Massachusetts wouldn't be necessary, as there isn't much as an incentive for what is typically a tedious process. Six months would be a much more uh, reasonable option, as it is up to date and not just manual for a smaller state. This removal of agriculture activities around the Penobscot River should be up from 300 feet to 500 feet, as the area is less developed, as the area is less developed and there's more ag agriculture activity in general versus the uh, Massachusetts counterpart. According to local responses to a survey, one in three residents use weed killers and pesticides in their properties. So another change to the act would be to allow locals to enforce the policy in their own towns in order to prevent outright dumping or excessive usage of uh, chemicals such as pesticides and fertilizers in their own properties in unreasonable amounts. This will cover the aspect of human behavior that the Clean Water Act has overall failed to contend with. Recently, the uh, Maine budget has increased from $3.8 billion in 2020 to $8.3 uh, billion in 2021. And environmental spending was 0.23%, uh, making the environmental budget for the state uh, $8.7 million. But with the new budget, if kept at the same percentage, would be $19.1 million, which is more than enough money to pursue this uh, policy. We've established the problem and solution. We now focus on implementing that solution. Um, this affects too many places to be municipal policy, so we must take it to the state. However, because it's a bigger body, it is harder to get a policy looked at. This is where special interest groups come in. A couple groups would be perfect for this. The NRCM, or the National Resources Council of Maine, they're great for this because they have tons of different things for protecting Maine's air, or the ground, like the forest and the water. And they got multiple initiatives on like protecting and restoring from, from like mining and uh, milling processes. The next one is the Penobscot Conservation Association, who is uh, dedicated to like protecting the forests in the area and the streams to protect it for like fishing and hunting. And so, with the support and lobbying from these groups, we can hopefully catch the attention of a representative. So our preferred representative is Maggie O'Neill, Democrat from Saco. That's her. And she's the chair of the Agriculture Conservation and Forestry Committee. There, as a committee, will make any changes and revisions of the bill required to prepare for the House floor. The House is a Democrat majority, so it shouldn't have too much trouble passing. The Senate chair for the committee is Jim Dill, who will introduce the bill to the Senate, which is also a Democrat majority much more radical environmental laws have passed. Next, the bill finds its way to Janet Mills' desk. The governor has the power to veto the bill, but as a Democrat, it seems unlikely. 
finally, the bill's been passed and the responsibility has been passed the DEP. It's their responsibility to enforce the policy and, do, and like send people out to check trains and whatnot. However, this process doesn't happen without opposition. Companies like Bangalore Lawn and Landscape is a local business that uses fertilizers and pesticides and will be directly affected. Pork and pest control will also be forced to decrease their business near water. In the act, we will have to rely on the support from people like Rick Fournier. He's on the Bangor City Council and was part of the Bangor Water District. Also, things like the Craigbrook National Fish Hatchery, who release fish in the Penobscot watershed and probably want them to live. So to summarize, we start with special interest groups, then go to the Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry Committee, then to the House and the Senate. Next, to the Governor, the DEP, all while we have opposition and support pushing it through. Okay, so next we have transportation and roadways in Maine. Perhaps any of you who are driving, you may have hit a frost heave or a pothole recently. We need the big and, that we have in one road. And so this group has identified what they think is the problem in Maine roads. So I will let them take it away. Alright, so our whole project um, basically focuses on like transportation and the roadways in Maine. And so um, our problem is that the main roads are in poor condition due to underfunding and um, the $232 million funding shortfall of 2019 surely doesn't help. Um, so we have a graph that shows what main people think the condition of main roads compared to 10 years ago. And um, this really puts into perspective how many people believe that they are worse and this highlights the problem, showing that it's recognizable among many people, as a lot of people voted that the roadways are somewhat worse, or like a lot worse. And um, this connects to how each driver in Maine loses roughly $1,560 annually, which equates to roughly $1.3 billion across all drivers in Maine. And the payment comes from vehicle repairs and maintenance um, due, due to poor roads. And Bangor Daily News reports that the cost that drivers spend on repairs will continue to rise unless more funding is provided to fix the roads. Yeah. Isn't this, this is a The problem with the roads was not just started this year. An article from the Bangor Daily News states that in 2019, the main DOT has stopped many construction projects, including ones that fix the roads, due to not enough funds to support, which demonstrates how more funding is needed to renovate main infrastructure. Um, the American Society of Civil Engineers rated Maine's infrastructure a C- in 2020, and this report card also highlighted that the roads in Maine were graded a D, proving that even professionals, not even in the state of Maine, um, can point out that our roads are in need of more funding and are in like bad condition. Our first option to raise more funds is to increase the fuel tax. As of now, the tax is says 30 cents per gallon. Currently, the fuel tax brings up 68.9% of Maine's highway fund. So an increase in the price would have a large impact on funding. In addition, the main wire reports that a one cent increase would generate 7.5 million more dollars if go towards the roads. There are also problems with this option too, like how this increase would not have an effect on electric vehicle owners, and the price of gas is also already increasing due to new federal policies, so another increase would not serve well for main residents. Our second option is to increase the vehicle registration fees. The graphic displayed shows how the vehicle registration fee is used in multiple states. The graphic only shows five states, but an article published by the Washington Examiner explained how 46 states use this as a method of transportation funding. This is important because other states have increased the registration, so if we propose this policy, it won't seem unordinary. The 
problem with this so the problem with this option are that there are, there may be more unregistered vehicles, and how everyone with equal year cars will have to pay the same in registration fees, even though some may put more miles on their car. Um, our third option is increasing the number of toll roads. Um, increasing the number of toll roads will produce enough revenue to solve Maine's funding shortfall and are economically efficient because drivers pay for their costs directly. But um, toll road, Maine toll roads are established by the Maine Turnpike Authority, meaning that if the number of toll roads did increase, this agency would also have to increase. However, the revenue produced from the tolls would be set aside for Maine highways and turnpike instead of local roads. And um, the Transportation Research Board explains how this policy would create traffic congestion and would harm businesses located along the interstate routes that would be subject to toll roads. Our fourth and final option in raising more funds is budget. This entails looking at where all the main DOT funds are going right now and reallocating some from certain areas such as highway and bridge capital to help with the road. Right now, only $43 million, or about 3% of all funds, are used on local road assistance. This option would help to raise more funds without raising taxes in other areas, and people would tend to support this if they feel it's not affecting them directly. The problem with this option is that people may be skeptical about cutting funds in other areas. After discussing all four options, we determined that increasing the vehicle registration fee is the best policy because of the revenue that it yields. Since all car users, both gas and electric, have to register their vehicles, the increase will receive the most revenue. These fees are applicable to all drivers, unlike the fuel tax, so a minor increase such as $5 would produce a large amount of revenue that would be used for local road repair and maintenance. current policy has managers paying a certain percentage of their manufactured suggested retail price, also known as MSRP, to register their vehicle. It starts at 2.4% of your MSRP and makes its way down to 0.4% by year six and stays at this percentage for subsequent years. The current registration fee decreases as the car ages, but an increase in this fee would hold drivers accountable since that car is still damaging the road no matter how old it is. This option will affect all drivers equally as gas and electric cars would both have to pay the increase and without these fees, drivers would have to pay taxes in different ways anyways. In the 2020 to 2021 budget overview by Governor Mills, motor vehicle registrations and fees were the second highest contributor to the main highway fund. The main highway fund accounts for most of the funding going towards the road to Maine. This chart shows how an increase in vehicle registration fees can greatly improve the overall. This question surveyed Herman High School seniors and students to see which of the four alternative policies they supported the most. Almost one fourth of the responses supported an increase in the vehicle registration fee, which is a fair amount. In an article titled, titled Oregonians to See Increased Cost for Car Registrations, a group strongly opposed increasing registration fees, even though it produced a large sum of revenue. Comparing the reaction of the residents of Oregon to the reaction here, it shows that the people of Herman wouldn't be opposed to an increase in taxes if it means that more funding would occur. So, proposing this increase in the vehicle registration fee requires legislation in the state government. Our first step in implementing this policy would be to provoke, would be to propose our policy to the Maine Department of Transportation uh, to get their approval that our bill complies with the Maine Constitution, particularly. Section 3A, which states that everyone who uses the roads must pay their fair share. Bruce A. Van Note wrote an article titled Main DOT Funding, which explained where the main DOT gets their funding for transportation and how it is divided up. His experience in finance regarding their funds will aid in formulating our bill. Next, we would need to propose this policy to an interest group that deals with transportation, such as the Transportation Communications Unit. Groups like these specialize in these areas and will provide information as for why increasing the registration fee will yield a large amount of funding from these groups. We will then work with legislators and chair members such as Bill Diamond, Mark Bryant, and Lynn Williams, who will act as a sponsor. These legislators will aid in formulating our bill in its proper form. 
which will then be introduced to one of the chambers of Maine's legislature. It will then be suggested to a recommended committee, such as the 130th committee, the Committee on Transportation. This bill will then receive testimonies for those who oppose or approve the bill. The testimonies that are heard for and against this bill have a large impact on if it will be implemented or not. An argument for this increase would be those who believe that electric car users don't pay their fair share in taxes because the car does not require fuel. An argument against this increase is someone that doesn't agree with increasing taxes. Political parties also play a role in these testimonies. These charts show the last time an increase in vehicle registration fee was proposed to Maine legislature and how Democrats and Republicans voted. In both cases, the vote had a yes majority due to a Democratic majority in both the House and Senate. After the testimonies are heard, the bill is voted on. If it is passed in the House, it will be given to the Senate where this process will repeat. After all this, the bill is sent to the current governor, Jane Adams. She can approve the bill, veto it, or do nothing. If passed, the bill will be enforced in 90 days unless the bill seems urgent enough to be enforced sooner. If the bill is vetoed, there are two two-thirds of both, both chambers of main legislature can undo the veto. In, both, in past cases, Democrats have approved an increase in the vehicle registration fee. So since there is currently a Democratic majority in both chambers, this bill will not likely pass. Okay, problem solved. found a new uh, road commission here. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Peterson and Making History. All right, well, our group decided to do, uh, to stop cosmetic testing on animals, and that was our project citizen project. Uh, my name is Gary. And I'm Allie. There are, there is a graphic image on so who in here has used makeup before? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you ever use shampoo or conditioner. So a lot of these companies that make these products, they test on animals in order to produce the products. Um, the main policy dealing with cosmetic animal testing is the Animal Welfare Act. And it was created in 1966, but it wasn't intended uh, to regulate the research stuff. It was only made to regulate how they were obtained and maintained. So it makes sure they get fed good, but it doesn't make sure that they are used correctly for research. Cosmetic testing is done on a wide range of animals, such as sheep, cats, pigs, dogs, primates, guinea pigs, rabbits, hamsters, and other species. Um, so these are some of the numbers that go into a lot of the cosmetic products that you use. Um, so 97 or 96% of them contain lead, and lead is very harmful. It can lead to brain damage, kidney damage, and if you have a lot of it, death. Um, beryllium is in 90% of them, and it can damage the lungs and cause pneumonia, and also chronic beryllium disease, which is a lung disease. 61% of cosmetics contain thallium, and thallium can cause fatigue, Um, so this is a map, and the red part shows where cosmetic animal testing is not banned, and the purple shows where it is uh, has a nationwide ban. So places like Europe and India have full bans on it, whereas the United States has no ban on it. This is Teddy, and Teddy and 31 other dogs have used cosmetic testing every single day with being injected with substances and being force fed. They lived in miserable conditions and responded to human attention. Um, they lived in barren cages which were lined up and we just kept the dogs in there. After one year, the eagles were released and now they all live in loving homes. We were to find a couple policies and a couple ways to solve this and our first one was on a national level. Our national level law would include banning cosmetic testing on animals, banning the sale of cosmetics that tested 
on the animals. And then an alternative would be in future testing, which is basically taking human cells and isolated tissues and taking tests off of those or computer models. So our other proposed policy was to create a law in the state of Maine that would ban the testing and ban the sale of cosmetic tested products. Um, and we'd have a fine of fine five thousand dollars for the first uh, disobedience, and then for any reoccurring disobediences, it could be more fines and also you could get arrested. Um, so we chose the main law because that would be more realistic. Only four states have banned uh, cosmetic testing, so it wouldn't really make sense to make a national law. Yeah, and like Gary said, since four states have banned it, we're looking to go in that direction and follow what they're doing. And if Maine were to ban it, there could be a possibility that more states would follow along afterwards. And while looking more closely and deeply into this, we noticed that Maine is already working on one, and it's called the Maine House Bill. And that plan is to ban the sale of cosmetics that have been tested on animals, but not necessarily the testing part. Um, Vicki Dudra is the person who proposed this bill. And we contacted her and asked her a couple questions trying to find, find out more information, such as who would oppose this bill and what could we as citizens do to help support it. Um, so our second step would be, after finding out who the opposers are, try to sway them toward our side of the argument. Um, and those would be Senate members and House of Representatives members, so we have to sway them. Um, step three would be making sure that the governor signs the bill. So after it gets approved through the Senate and House of Representatives, excuse me, um, the governor would have to sign it. And so we have to make sure either she knows about it or call her, email her, and tell her our side of the story. So to wrap it all up, animals are being tested on, and we need to Um, and thank you for your time. Uh, so we have a few presentations today. Uh, my class from Power to the People are going to be presenting their project citizen presentations. So we have uh, one looking at the Sunday hunting laws, and then we have another presentation looking at the progressive federal income tax system. Um, so each of these groups are going to present these problems and, and some of the solutions that they came up uh, to address these problems. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, or just invite the first group to come on up and share your presentation. Economics, spending money for hunting in state or out of state. So the majority of states, you can hunt on Sundays. So say you live in New Hampshire, you want to go to Maine on a hunting trip, but you're disencouraged to come to Maine on a hunting trip and you can't even hunt on Sundays. Hunting is much more than just buying guns and ammo. If you come to Maine, you're also buying stuff at local businesses, you're you know, lodging at hotels. So you're spending a lot of money in the state of Maine. It also reduces the engagement for hunting for no good reason. There's no reason not to have Sunday hunting because the law itself is an the law. And Sunday hunting can only really help the economy. Again, you know, you're dis disencouraging a hobby for no particular reason. And you're only really shooting yourself in the foot in this situation. 
Here's a number of visitors to Maine. Um, as you can see here, it's, it's stagnated in recent years. From 15 to 16, it raised by quite a lot. However, visitors are basically everyone that comes to Maine for an extended period of time. And that includes, it extends over to people going on hunting trips. And visitors, of course, bring money to the economy. Uh, Walmart basically like um, symbolizes businesses here. You know, you buy stuff here, you buy your guns, ammo, lodging, which all contributes to our economy. So this Sunday hunting law is government overreach. So this is abuse of government power. Uh, the government should not be able to have the power to restrict you from hunting on certain days. And it's just plain unconstitutional for them to be able to control, control something like that. So there's only a few states um, in the U.S. that prohibit restrict Sunday hunting. So all the blue states have no restrictions on, on Sunday hunting. Um, the yellow states restrict certain um, certain parts of Sunday hunting, so you can hunt on Sundays under certain conditions. And then red states, Maine, Massachusetts, you cannot hunt on Sundays under any conditions. You can see it's all on the East Coast, kind of where the settlers came in um, to the U.S. This is kind of you know kind of lies with you know uh, like like Mike said, we're on religion and all that. Because Kind of settlers moved in and made Massachusetts for the first two kind of areas settled. So the current law in Maine prohibits anyone from hunting on Sundays under any conditions. Uh, again, it was in 1883 it was published, uh, kind of in Christian tradition. Um, it also states that violence of this crime are class E criminals, which is pretty harsh punishment for hunting on the wrong day of the week. Our group did a, did a survey, and we did we did the staff and every student in our high school, and and the 60 responses we got, roughly 60% said they did not hunt, and uh, roughly 40% said so they did. So that's out of one in four people in our high school that hunts, or roughly one in four people. Um, we oh, I, another question we asked is, do you think that you should be able to hunt? If, if you were able to hunt, do you think you should? Do you think that you should be able to hunt on Sundays in Maine? 44% uh, of people said yes. 32.4% uh, people said uh, no. And the other 23 said they didn't have an opinion. So one of the uh, one of the things that we chose to do for this was to boycott tagging. And uh, whenever you shoot a wild animal like a deer, you have to purchase a tag. And uh, that costs money and that money goes to the government. So if you stop purchasing tags, then that will, you will be paying the government for that stuff. So to make the state aware of the effect that tagging has on the economy, it introduces pressure on the state to introduce the bill because it won't be making any money on the tags. And it shows that hunters have power to help economically on Sunday hunting. Uh, so another potential solution we have would be to follow the current bill that's in the main legislature today. Um, there has been a proposal to um, allow some restricted Sunday hunting, and as in our legislature, um, basically under certain conditions, so you can only hunt deer during deer season on your own property. If you own 20 acres or more and your land's not posted, you also have to buy a specific Sunday hunting deer tag, which is going to cost around $40. That's in our legislature today, and that's currently a, a um, you know, that's being voted on soon. Another potential solution we have uh, is creating a new bill where you would be able to hunt without restrictions. In the majority of states, this is the current law. More people would come to the state to come on hunting vacations, which is it only helps the economy. Um, when more people come to the state, also bring more money to the business owners and the state. And the law itself is an outdated blue law. So there's no real reason to have such a law anymore. So our current bill, um, we're just kind of waiting to decide for support on our current bill that's in the legislature, um, SLD 1033. Um, it has traction, it's kind of supported by a lot of organizations in our um, state, you know, NRA, um, other pro hunting groups, you know, Maine Sportsman Alliance and stuff like that. Um, we can support the, the bill by informing the, the community, um, you know, about um, you know how good this can be for our state um, economically and all that, and also by encouraging senators and you know prominent um, politicians to vote plus for the bill. So for educating the public, we can do something like a public advertisement, maybe a sign, 
Uh, and basically everyone these days watches YouTube so you can localize the advertisements so you can make an advertisement about why something hunting is good, why it shouldn't be prohibited, and why it helps the economy. So contacting our organizations, we reached out to uh, the main IFW, um, in the Fisheries and Wildlife. They actually opposed the Sunday hunting bill due to um, their concern about population management. You know, if there's an extra day of hunting, there's potential for more animals to be tagged and killed, which could hurt the populations and management of their um, wildlife. Um, another concern there is with landowners. So a lot of people um, who own a lot of land do not want people hunting on Sundays on their land because they'd like a day um, to go use their own property for like, you know, hiking or fishing or what have you. Um, and if there were Sunday hunting, they could potentially risk that. We also reached out to Senator Jeff Timberlake in our area. He was the one who actually sponsored the bill in the first place. Um, he believes the landowner's right to um, hunt whenever you want on your property because it's your property and it's your right. will have 20% will keep 
gives a better sense of fairness, but lower classes will have a slight tax increase, and it does benefit the upper classes more, and there is a lack of wealth. Our second possible solution is a flat, flat tax rate of 10%, but increasing goods and services taxes. So 45% of the country's tax revenue comes from income tax, and only 18% comes from goods and services. If we switch those, the tax revenue would still be the same, but the income tax would only be 10%, so it's more fair to the wealthy people. And you're basically spending your taxes on stuff you want, and not, it's not coming out of your income. The third solution that we thought of was a flat tax rate of 10 percent and an increase in business and corporation taxes. This is really the similar to same solution, but it just switches what you put out those taxes on instead. The 10 percent income tax for all individuals, the increase, you need to increase the tax percentage on businesses as well as lender corporations. This will make up for the lost money because of the decrease in taxes for most of the population. The businesses will make up for their lost money from taxes in more business, and but it does hurt the, the business profits. Um, the one we chose was to just have a flat rate of 20% and not increasing anything else because that seems the most fair. It's increasing the lower class a little bit, but it's coming down a lot more wealthy. We're still getting the same amount of tax revenue. The top 1% will no longer be paying to support nearly a quarter of the country, which is a lot of the government voters. Our first action plan was to contact Michael Burgess. Michael Burgess is a Texas representative fighting for flat taxes. He thinks that we should have a flat tax rate of 19% for the first two years next being 17%. This explains the first two years of a presidential election, the taxes will be 19%, then they will go down 2% after that. He tried to get a bill signed and a bill going, but it died in Congress. We want to ask honest, his honest opinion on this issue and ask how he thinks we as students can help promote this issue. Our second step would be to contact our main representatives, ask their opinions, ask for support, and then if we got a large enough support, we could uh, bring it to the House to get voted on and if it's passed, and then we go to Congress. The conclusion on this is we have looked at this problem and have gone through multiple different steps to find different action plans. We looked on how to understand the problem. We looked at potential solutions, and finally we looked at the action plan what we were going to do is students to help. All right, any comments or questions for this group? Thank you so much. Hello and good morning, everybody. Today, this is the Making History class for Block 3, and they're putting on a play, a performance, um, about a hypothetical history. So, the theme of today is, what if the ancient Mesopotamians had not invented the wheel? What would society look like today without the wheel? I hope you enjoy the show. Alright, I'll see you guys later. If we didn't have our modern 
delivery system, we were still be using systems such as the Pony Express. The Pony Express was a system of U.S. mail delivery by horse riding. The route was nearly 2,000 miles from Hong Kong and had about 190 stations. Riders had to weigh less than 125 pounds to keep the weight down. The delivery was sometimes affected by weather attacks, by weather attacks by bandits and robbers. Rum, rum, skirt, skirt, skirt. Rum, rum, rum. Yeehaw! 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 Here's your pizza. It's a little dusty. Have fun trying to cut it. Thanks, Drew. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> you better hurry up and cut my pizza or I'm going to get mad. Oh, it's taking forever. I wish I had an easier way. Man, I wish I had a truck to deliver things. I wish I had an easier way to cut pizza. I wish there was a different way to bring King Island to a drone. This shows the importance of the wheel, whether it is to deliver pizza, cut pizza, or bring the king to their throne. Without the wheel, today's society would function much differently, causing more labor and hardship. The end. Just 
Deal with it. Deal with it? Alright, what are we going to do? Let me see the file. the Russian Mafia's plan to get some uranium. They planned to sell it to the Soviet government so they could blow up an American submarine.
Oh no, where did, where's Helen? You must find her. I am here, brave soldiers. Helen! Thank you for saving me. We must return to Greece at once. Avoid the dead body. Oh, 
Introducing Napoleon versus Stalin. No more cannons or immediate disqualification. Napoleon, you look five foot three. You're as short as can be. You're a dwarf, a midget, half man, half mouse, more. Oh, let's take out a ruler. You're five five. I'm five six. The end. <laughs> <laughs> And then thanks to everyone who came and was a, a great audience today. Uh, if, if these are things that look fun, take uh, these classes so you can do these projects. Thank you. All right. Join, joining us today, uh, my Making History class is going to put on a performance for you that they've been working on. It's uh, a Great Depression era uh, bank robber sort of story. So um, they're gonna get going. In 1934, the Herman Heisters were desperate for money after dealing with the effects of the Great Depression. They spent days plotting ways to rob banks in the Hooverville area in order to close the gap that the Great Depression had created. We've been living in this Hooverville for dang near four months now. We have got to do something to get up out of this place. Man.
Thank you very much for coming here for our performance. Woo! Good morning, audience members. Today, my Making History class is going to be doing a presentation um, of a skit, um, and this is an alternative history. So it's an alternative history on women's rights, um, and you'll see sort of what happens with this, but sort of the premise is what if rights, women's rights didn't happen immediately, and there was more of a, um, a slower change with that. So that's what this skit is about. I hope you enjoy it.
Hello, fellow Americans. I'm proud to present myself to you as your new president. No, shame. We deserve to have the rights that every man has. I'm so much more than a stay-at-home wife. I will do my best to be the best possible president for this country and improve our economy. The United States will be strong and respected. God bless America. It is important to note that in our production, Cox wins the election, which differs from reality. In truth, Harding actually won the election due to the overwhelming number of female votes. The numerous ripple effects that an election has are countless. However, if women do not have the right to vote, as they don't in this presentation, then everything, both beneficial and detrimental, that happened because of that president wouldn't have happened. I just got word that the 19th Amendment was passed and the women now have the right to vote. And Cox is reluctant to admit it. Today is today. I will follow through with what I witnessed that woman attempting to do 52 years ago. I will vote. A woman! Thank you all for coming.